Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our seminar today. Um, covering a lot of topics re related to violence over the first term here. I hope um, those who aren't signed up for class uh, find out about the, the list of seminars that we're having every Monday at this time. Um, I, because I get spread a little bit too thin, I try to use this seminar for multiple purposes. I think it's a nice venue to introduce graduate students to uh, a really important topic in public health, violence and violence prevention. Um, but a lot of my work um, focuses on Baltimore these days and uh, various partnerships to uh, help Baltimore reduce violence. Um, and it's, um, so I, I very intentionally select topics that are gonna be most relevant to, to Baltimore. And I think probably the one we're gonna talk about today hits Baltimore pretty square in terms of uh, the challenges that we face in, in reducing um, violence and a lot of other related um, public health problems. Um, I'm really honored also today to have a discussant, Michael Botticelli, who is, um, he's has a formal position at Hopkins now as a distinguished policy scholar. We're very honored to have him. Um, he is more famously known as the former director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy otherwise known as the drug czar. I probably should have asked you, Michael, whether that drug czar thing, how comfortable or not you are with that. No, not so much. Let's stick with the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, so the way we're gonna do this today is I am going to uh, present some data. Some, some of it is sort of natural and sort of national and sort of big picture. And, uh, but I'm gonna work my way down to some Baltimore uh, data and examples and some of the uh, interesting uh, questions and challenges I think that those data raise. And that will then uh, feed into, uh, will transition then into sort of a panel of two up here in which mostly I will uh, ask Michael his reflections and his thoughts on some of these key challenges that we face and also open it to this uh, diverse, uh, interesting group of folks who, who've come today. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. Um, so, so now we're just gonna cover some, some basics. Um, if you talk to people in Baltimore, um, uh, at least on the law enforcement side, they will, they will say a very large share of our, our homicides are drug related. Um, if you look at the data that the FBI compiles to so the Uniform Crime Reports data, and um, <clears throat> what do we know about the circumstances surrounding homicides or, or murders, uh, it's a little honestly difficult to interpret, mostly because 40% of the homicides, we don't know. They, they, aren't, they aren't solved in any to, to anybody's satisfaction in law enforcement that they know for sure who did it and why they did it. Is it drug related or not? Well, we, if you don't know, if you haven't made an arrest of successful um, uh, investigation or prosecution, then you have a big unknown category. Another 40% of the cases, some sort of interpersonal conflict argument kind of scenario. If you look at the categories that the FBI has created that have drug and or gang connected to them, it's 16.5%, which seems to me, at least someone, again, who spent my career uh, here in Baltimore as a low number. So my hunch is it's probably more than 16.5%, and that 40% of that big mystery, right? My, my sense is that, um, a healthier share of those are gonna be drug related than of the known categories, principally because it is difficult, more difficult for police to solve these crimes. And I'm gonna actually get into that a little bit as I get deeper into this conversation. 
Um, violating a, 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 a law relevant to uh, illegal drugs is one of the most common reasons people are arrested and, and are behind bars. Uh, these come from the same uh, reporting system from the FBI, these for arrest. And about 14%, the most serious crime, is, uh, is a drug violation. Now, many of these other categories with respect to property crimes, for example, many of the people committing burglaries, stealing cars, doing things, are doing things maybe to, to support a habit, perhaps. Um, there are also a lot of weapon offenses as well. So. But this is, it's a very common reason why people enter, get arrested and, and enter the law enforcement criminal justice system. Uh, these data uh, reflect what we know about uh, drug abuse and drug dependence in incarcerated populations. Um, so the first two bars here are for state prisoners and people who are in local jails after having been sentenced um, and, and you'll see roughly 60% with some um, drug-related use problem, uh, largely with, with dependency, which of course dwarfs the, what um, the levels of drug dependence and drug abuse are in the adult general population. So there's clearly some connection between using illegal drugs, being dependent on illegal drugs, and being incarcerated. And, and committing certain crimes, including, including violence. Um, these are some national numbers, some of which uh, I, I, you'll, you'll note the most important thing is the upward trend in how much uh, federally we are spending on treatment. And our discussant has a big role in why that slope was going in that direction. And he deserves a great deal of credit. Um, but um, the bulk of our resources have been connected to some aspect of interdiction and drug law enforcement. This is just federal dollars, by the way. If we totaled in what we spend on local policing, state courts, prisons, and so on, um, this would be um, a much different picture in terms of resource allocation. Um, arrests for drug crimes have been trending down in recent years as this graph here indicates. These are, um, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, ar arrests of only through 2015. The 2016 data are not out yet. Um, the bulk of these arrests are not for illegal uh, sales um, or manufacturing, but principally for uh, illegal possession so these are, these are um, a lot of people who are being arrested because, probably because they're using drugs, illicit drugs. This is sort of the general breakdown of the types of drugs um, that people are arrested for. Um, marijuana uh, accounting for a pretty healthy share here. I suspect that this will be a shrinking part of the, the pie as more states are uh, decriminalizing marijuana. Now I want to get sort of into the heart of the matter, which is um, how do we approach this? I'm going to talk a, a lot about law enforcement um, approach to, to drugs as a mechanism to reduce violence, because clearly there is a connection between illegal drug use, sales, and violence. And the question really at hand is, what do you do about that? Well, the traditional mindset has been sort of based on a, on a theory. The theory is fairly simple, which is by criminalizing drug sales and use and having um, significant enforcement, you're going to raise the cost. Uh, if you're thinking of this in economic terms, which you should, you're going to raise the cost of this. And by raising the cost, we're going to reduce consumption, sales, and the related crime that occurs from that. Of course, what actually happens is a purely a function of a set of complicated demand and supply curves and functions. The, the, not only for the product themselves, the illegal drugs, but also of the suppliers. What do we know about the supply 
the, the, the labor pool, okay, in the uh, current underground economy for drugs. Well, what we know is that for many, many years, uh, particularly since uh, uh, so many jobs in manufacturing that used to be there aren't there, a lot of people will gravitate into this illegal economy as a way to um, uh, sustain themselves. So the reality is um, there does not seem to have been much effect if you're looking in terms of changes in price and supply of illegal, illegal drugs. The, the price and purity of illicit drugs um, has increased, not gone down. Uh, of course, we have a, uh, we, we've not uh, curbed addiction through our enforcement processes. It's probably not um, news to anyone that there's uh, considerable racial disparities in this too. Even though drug use itself um, is not all that different uh, across racial lines, most people being incarcerated um, are non-white individuals. <clears throat> this, of course, has implications very broadly for um, the things that we know, if based on theory and data, that keep people out of crime and violence, which is a good, steady job. So if you are arrested be, be for using and or selling drugs, that stays with you. And a lot of strategies that we'll probably talk a little bit about at the end of the talk to, to basically um, help individuals who have drug arrests, drug convictions on their record, uh, get back into the economy and society in healthy and productive ways. But currently, it's, it's uh, unquestionable that um, raging, the, the, the illegal economies now in many of our neighborhoods in Baltimore and many other cities are really destroying a lot of lives. <clears throat> so what do police actually do? What does it look like? So the very traditional uh, ways that uh, police have responded to this problem is um, they will, in open air um, selling situations, they will, they will come in and sort of clear the corners. This is something uh, very common in Baltimore for many years, particularly during a zero, sort of so-called zero tolerance policy under uh, Martin O'Malley administration. Um, there, um, there are raids on, on houses where the drugs are kept. Um, they're undercover buys and bust. And um, I'll also talk about sort of more progressive, if you will, kind of things that aren't just enforcement, sort of what we, some refer to as problem-oriented uh, policing. So it's, it's ranged the gamut here. Um, <clears throat> despite the incredible amount of resources that are devoted to um, law enforcement directed at illegal drug sales, um, there is shockingly, shockingly uh, little solid research on what the impact of, of all of that effort uh, actually has on violent crime. The vast majority of studies that actually follow uh, change over time when there is some usually a major operation done to disrupt illegal drugs, more often than not, that tends to uh, result in more, not less, violence. Um, and we can learn a lot, not only from sort of the quantitative analysis, but the actual qualitative. What, what do the ethnographic types of studies tell us? Um, and what, they, what you learn from that is, is more about the why. If, if law enforcement disruptions in illegal drug economy uh, increases violence, why, why might that be? Um, and you, um, there, there, there are a few different ways. And actually, if anyone has watched The Wire, they show you some of these ways in pretty powerful stories. Um, but individuals, who, someone who might be arrested, and, uh, particularly as part of a broader operation to take down a drug selling group or, or organization, um, they are sort of pawns in this. And the prosecutors and police are often trying to get to the leaders. 
But those pawns are very vulnerable because when they are uh, arrested and brought in for questionings, they can, in essence, sort of be uh, sacrificed by the uh, heads of the organization so that uh, it, they make sure nobody um, snitches on, on somebody else. And of course, there are other uh, ways that uh, you take out suppliers and then you open up competition for that market um, as well. Now, in addition to the more traditional, we're just going to go in and arrest a lot of people who are selling illegal drugs or possessing illegal drugs. Uh, police have also used uh, different forms of community policing and, and um, what is known as problem-oriented policing. So this recognizes that in, in communities affected most by violence and drugs, they have a whole host of problems with abandoned housing, um, all kinds of really bad conditions. And um, uh, over, over time, uh, police have, um, in collaboration often with uh, other city agencies or, or neighborhood groups, uh, tried to address some of those underlying problems um, uh, that, that are connected to uh, illegal drugs. And um, this is sort of a, there, there's sort of a spectrum of more community focused and, and more focused sort of geographically and by, by person. What um, the review of this research finds um, is that um, basically, um, let me just go to this. <clears throat> um, some had some impact in reducing drug related uh, crime and some property related crime. But not a single one of them actually achieved any uh, significant reduction in violent crime. This will be sort of a theme as, as we go through that a lot of very well-intended and even somewhat semi-sophisticated approaches, more sophisticated than just coming up and arresting a lot of people in a corner, um, what challenges there are to actually uh, reducing violence, perhaps because of some of these underlying uh, supply and demand issues that I was mentioning. So um, among the more uh, progressive, sophisticated approaches to addressing this is something um, in the broadest category is thought of as focused deterrence. Uh, it was uh, sort of developed and uh, initially and, and changed over time by David Kennedy, a uh, criminologist now at um, John Jay Criminal um, School of Criminal Justice. Generally, what this approach does is that it identifies who the actors of interest are. So they might be a group who are selling drugs and perhaps generating a lot of violence connected to that. They will gather information and focus their enforcement resources on them. But they will also call them in um, uh, and, and offer them services as well. So. They come in with a lot of what they call levers um, of potential ways that they could take uh, action to arrest and prosecute these individuals. But the, it's supposed to be a preventive message, which is we, we don't want to arrest you. We don't want to incarcerate you. We want you to change your criminal behavior. And we're going to provide some help, actually, in that too, actual services, helping you get jobs, drug treatment, or whatever it is that you need combine that with um, sort of community support so that the message isn't coming just from a, a police chief or, or a head prosecutor, but it's actually coming from the community. Um, this has a remarkable track record. In, I'm not saying it's perfect track record because it hasn't worked so well yet in Baltimore. But uh, in most cities, this has had a pretty uh, large and consistent effect in reducing um, urban gun violence. Um, but it has also been applied uh, with the ultimate outcome. So traditionally, this was you're going to a group, they're almost always involved in illegal drug sales and other underground uh, um, economy activities. And you're principally telling them, stop the violence. They then said, okay, we're going to try to 
take it one step further. We're going to actually bring people in and say, you have to stop selling drugs. Okay, and it started with this, uh, the high point, uh, what they call a drug market intervention of, of using the same set of principles of focused deterrence um, in there. Um, the initial uh, data uh, reported from this were, was almost like a miracle, a very large reduction, 57% reduction uh, in drug-related violence in the areas of High Point, North Carolina, where they targeted this intervention. However, a much more thorough uh, study that uh, used much more sophisticated methodology actually estimated uh, effect, true effect of about a 12% reduction in violence. That was statistically significant. Um, there, after a lot of fanfare, there was a lot of replication. Anytime you have a successful intervention in something as big as uh, drug crime, uh, there's a lot of people interested around the country who want to say, hey, let's try this, right? So there have been probably about a dozen or so attempted replications of this. And uh, there's some recent uh, uh, new research in a uh, journal called Criminology and Public Policy. Johnny Bugs and I uh, wrote a sort of commentary in response to this in reviewing all the data. Long story short is it's not a very um, pretty picture in terms of um, the the Places that have tried to replicate this, uh, more often than not, actually saw increases in violence. Some saw, some saw some decline, but generally not statistically significant. So generally, I am very pessimistic that this is a model, particularly that can be applied. I mean, look, High Point, North Carolina. OK, I know if I was living in a High Point, North Carolina, in a place that, where there was drug selling, I would think it was a really big deal. But to say if you can do that in North Carolina, in, in High Point, you can do it in Baltimore, it's a whole nother question in terms of the set of, again, the set of, set of supply and demand issues that we have here in a city, <clears throat> pardon me, with very, very high rates of addiction, very high numbers of uh, individuals who want to participate in a, uh, um, or have chosen to participate in illegal economies. Um, so uh, I want to now uh, start to shift gears a little bit in, in the Baltimore. I've mentioned some of these general uh, ways in which uh, the drug selling economy can uh, facilitate or, or lead to violence. I, I didn't mention, but uh, a very common problem, not surprisingly, is dealers being robbed because they have money on them. They uh, have um, also had drugs, which is a very um, also you can turn into money. Um, so, as I mentioned, our, we've had for many years taken a very uh, traditional approach to, to this. Again, that was very well depicted in The Wire um, and uh, really particularly depicted sort of an O'Malley era with a lot of, lot of arrest um, for, for drugs. That started to change when Fred Biefeld, um, sorry. <clears throat> uh, became police commissioner in 2007 and said pretty explicitly, uh, we're going to refocus our, uh, our resources. It's not that we won't arrest people selling drugs, but our principal focus is going to be violence, gun violence. And, um, and I think since then, a, more of our activities on the policing and prosecution side have been directed towards people who not simply just because they're in the uh, illegal drug economy, but because they are shooting people. Um, all right. Um, this is what our, our trends look like if you just look at our homicide rate. And um, we, we actually were starting to see some progress uh, from 2007 to 2011, 12, 13 before things changed very abruptly, of course, after the unrest following um, Freddie Gray. Is this some emergency that I need to be worried about? It's sheltering in place there's in Curtis a, Bay. There's a chemical leak in South Baltimore. South Baltimore. OK. I there's think the roads that are affected are not included. OK. Those, but we're going. I didn't want to be insensitive if, if we were um, 
if you were in some immediate threat. <laughs> All right, keep going. All right, so that, this is what our, 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 our homicide uh, rate looks like. Um, and one, one theory about this abrupt change of why in the world did things change so dramatically, literally overnight after that unrest. And one theory put out, particularly early on with then Commissioner Tony Batts, is that a lot of this had to do with a lot of pharmacies were uh, looted, and um, a lot of product was then on the streets. And in essence, that itself was a disrupting force in Baltimore's opiate economy. All right. Um, nevertheless, our drug arrest trends kept going down. If, if all of a sudden you've got all this illegal drugs and there's a lot more illegal drugs on the market in this disruptive way, it is not reflected, at least in their arrest data. Our, our arrests uh, for trafficking charges have continued to decline in 2015 and 2016, just that they've been doing for a very long time. Uh, similar uh, general, a uh, little more complicated, but general same pattern as it relates to um, CDS is controlled dangerous substance, by the way, which is drugs. Um, so that's, that's our pattern. So um, um, I've led a team here looking at the trends in uh, homicides and non-fatal shootings uh, by police posts from 2003 through 2006, looking at a variety of place-based interventions and uh, enforcement practices to try to understand their temporal spatial relationship to these key outcomes that we track in the Baltimore Sun on a daily basis. Um, what we found is that under BFL, when we shifted with a, more of our energies on gun violence and a little less on drugs, that uh, that was in a very broad general way <clears throat> associated with um, 20 to 25% reduction in uh, homicides and non-fatal shootings. But what about the drug um, uh, enforcement metrics themselves? We found uh, no association whatsoever between how many people were arrested on uh, drug charges um, in a post in a given month and the subsequent level of uh, uh, gun violence the following month um, prior to the unrest. After the unrest, uh, it seemed as though um, it actually um, was counterproductive. The more of those arrests, the more violence. Um, that, that was for drug possession arrest. There was zero relationship between just the gross number of drug distribution uh, arrests. Here's where it gets a little bit interesting. We did a, uh, we, we looked at drug law enforcement in terms of its ability to kind of um, disrupt, be disruptive in a given area. And one way we looked at that is sort of simply, what's the tail end of the distribution of a whole lot of people arrested on drug charges in a given month in an area? Um, Tony, what was our sort of metric of how many it had to be? I'm trying to remember. Over 15 in a month in a given police post, which is a fair, not, there weren't a lot of observations. So it was, we, we referred to this as a surge. A lot of people were being arrested. Um, and what we found is that that led to no change in homicides, but actually increased non-fatal shootings by 23% for a three-month period following that surge. And then it sort of re uh, resor resorted back to its steady state. When we looked at major drug busts, which was a very crude metric that, again, were more driven and motivated by who was driving violence, there was a slight hint of a potential protective effect for about six months. It was not significant at 0.05. It was at, at 0.1 level. So it may be that it could be that, at least for a very temporary um, basis, that those could be um, uh, depressing violence for a very short amount of time. The ceasefire focused deterrence uh, model that had been effective in other places actually was uh, 
did not affect homicides, but appeared to be associated with more, not less, shootings. Interestingly, uh, we found that um, the focus, when the focus was on gun violence with special uh, squads focused on guns, as well as uh, the Safe Streets program, which some of you know is a public health model that involves credible messengers helping resolve conflicts. Many of those conflicts that they are resolving actually are disputes uh, related in some way or form to the illegal drug economy. And, and those were associated with significant reductions in shootings. We, um, I want to mention, um, aside from the policing side, I want to talk just a little bit about what happens after arrest. Uh, talk about drug courts, and then we'll we'll get into our uh, discussion with uh, with Michael. But uh, one approach to uh, recognizing that so many people who are coming through this uh, system, uh, criminal justice system, have drug problems, is to actually use the courts to facilitate, encourage um, people stopping using drugs, hopefully through uh, some treatment process. Uh, drug courts often have uh, a mandatory uh, testing component to it uh, with uh, supervision through the probation, state probation. Um, and you, you have to reappear in court uh, to make sure that you are abiding by the, the, what you needed to do to stay off of drugs. That's generally how they're, uh, how they're set up. So there's been a whole lot of studies about the effects of these. The vast majority of them are very poor quality, sadly. Um, the, one, the better studies do find, uh, more often than not, that the drug court population does slightly better than the uh, more traditional, no, no help, just you're going to jail kind of uh, approach. The uh, benefits seem to be stronger when the judge makes very clear what the expectations and requirements are up front. It's also seem to have better outcomes when there is a single provider rather than multiple providers. And I think that tends to be because there are very set standards rather than just go get treatment any place you want to. Uh, there's, there's actually standards, um, and, and they do better with better standards. Um, but uh, those studies also show um, perhaps what's not too surprising, which is the f protective effect uh, that is there tends to decay over time. One of the better studies and few studies that actually did a randomized trial was a drug court here in Baltimore. But I want to just show you these numbers to give you a little bit of perspective. Even though there are statistically significant differences between the treatment or drug control, uh, drug court group and the comparison group, um, that is a very high rearrest rate, even in the treatment group. Uh, so more often than not, crime has not ceased when you go through the court system. There, there was a, a notable uh, lower rate of uh, sex and violent uh, charges. Um, so from a pure return on investment, it seems to be drug courts better than the current uh, system. Um, but nowhere close to probably what we in public health would really see as, as ideal. Um, so one of the things, uh, it, pose, it brings certain questions forward about we know that treatment, we don't have near the treatment resources to meet the demand. And it raises sort of interesting ethical questions about who gets to the head of the line. A lot of people are affected by this. A lot of them don't have any resources, don't have insurance, or, or have difficulty getting help. Um, you know, I, I think it's just sort of interesting that um, that being being arrested can actually put you ahead of someone that uh, hasn't been arrested. So these are some of the quick questions. Now, another model um, uh, from the drug court uh, approach is, is a new orientation built on uh, sort of, I guess you would say, the behavioral economics of what we know about criminal offending. 
which is that long sentences really don't seem to have a huge effect on criminal behaviors, but it's how swift and certain outcomes are due. And this general uh, um, principle, if you will, was demonstrated in a program in Hawaii uh, that was focused on drug offenders, people who were um, convicted on drug charges and put in something called an opportunity uh, probation program in Hawaii. The principal difference here from the drug court thing is they actually, there was no treatment component here. It was just purely, this is the consequence. If you fail your drug test, you're going, you're going to spend some time in jail. You're not going to spend years in jail. It might be a day. It might be a weekend. But there's going to be a swift and certain outcome to that. And um, they found rather remarkable differences this is in a randomized trial here, uh, recidivism numbers for uh, arrested, uh, uh, being arrested and using drugs in the um, intervention and control, quite, quite stark differences. So it may be that <clears throat> as much as we would uh, like everybody to get treatment, uh, there perhaps is some therapeutic benefit from the swift and certain certainty of the consequences, which is maybe a little bit hard to wrap our brains around as we are public health people saying, boy, we've really gotten off the tracks here with thinking about this only as a law, uh, law and order kind of problem as opposed to a public health question. I'm going to now sort of go to the next part of, of our meeting today and have Michael join me up here. We're just going to have a couple of chairs here. So you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about these same challenges, thinking of, and, and, and all the political uh, challenges that, that this presents. Um, what is in your mind, sort of, can you put forward what your vision was, was when you were working for the White House? You clearly were trying to steer things more towards a treatment public health orientation. Talk to us about sort of that long term vision and then sort of maybe short term. Uh, hurdles or whatever to get over. Hi, it's, um, it's good to be here. Just as a little background in case you're not familiar with kind of our office to the degree that I was. So we were established in 1988 by Congress to do really two things. One, set the current administration's drug policy strategy. And as you can imagine, you know, that policy um, really straddled all, just about every department uh, in federal government. And the second piece, which was somewhat unique, is that we actually had statutory authority over those agencies' budgets. So, so basically, that means, now it doesn't mean we could usurp Congress in terms of that, or, um, but it meant that we asked federal agencies to basically align their budget to meet with our federal drug strategy priority. So it wasn't just a rhetorical document. Mm -hmm. It was really, it had some weight behind it in terms of what we were doing. And the chart that you first showed in terms of looking at drug control spending was what we would look at about where was drug policy going. So I, you know, I think you all know that historically, if you look at federal drug control spending, the vast majority of that was spent on you know, our international interdiction efforts, right? So you know, cutting, pulling coca in Colombia and you know, eradicating poppy in Mexico and interdiction strategy. So how many tons of cocaine did the Coast Guard pull from the waters? Um, and much less on the public health side of the equation, the prevention and treatment side of this. Um, and quite honestly, the people who had my job kind of reflected that uh, um, reflected that focus. These were largely generals or law enforcement folks. And I was actually the first person to have a job that had a public health background. And just, I think you also know, I've also been in recovery for a long time, so I have some personal experience with this issue. So, so part of what we really tried to do under the Obama administration, this is your point, and I think this is where we got some criticism, is you know of really looking at how, how do we begin to steer this huge shift in the opposite direction here and really look at, you know, how do we pivot 
to much more of a public health response to this and really looking at, one, uh, enhanced focus on prevention, treatment, recovery, support efforts. And you know, the, that spending actually was largely driven by the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion, right? So in the debate over some of the House uh, and Senate bills, it's interesting that the opioid epidemic came up in talking about places like Ohio and Kentucky, that the role that Medicaid expansion had in terms of creating larger uh, treatment access. But, but also beginning to think about, you know, how do we think about criminal justice reform in the context of drug policy and really thinking about moving people away, away from arrest and incarceration um, and quite honestly into treatment. And, uh, you know, the numbers of people who are in our jails and prisons, I think, are a stark reminder of, of what, um, how people get there. There's some data points that I think are really interesting. Only about 10%, 10 to 14% of people in the United States actually get treatment, right? And you compare that to diabetes, where the treatment rate is about 70, uh, about 75%. And if you look at the referrals to treatment, the biggest referral source to treatment is our criminal justice system, right? And I'm a living example of that, right? And so, so despite the fact that we say this is a health and public health issue, quite honestly we are missing opportunities. It, it, we always let people progress to their most acute phase, and it's often an intersection with the criminal justice system where we're first identifying people. Only 8% of referrals come from our healthcare system, right? So I'm at a hospital system now, and we're, like, we're trying to improve that. So in, in essence, we have set the system up to make it a criminal justice response to this. We have, like, we, we have not implemented this public health framework or this chronic disease framework for addiction yet, where we're looking at, you know, um, prevention, early intervention, you know, treatment at the first sign. So, so we're setting people up to to actually um, intersect with the criminal justice system uh, uh, around those kinds of issues. Uh, you know, and I will say some of the challenges uh, are around that. Um, so, so part of it when you think of criminal justice reform, I break it down into three buckets. One, how do we divert people away from the criminal justice system in the first place? And often, how do we do that in ways where people's arrest record, one, they have no arrest, and if they are arrested, their arrest record is not basically a lifelong sentence for them in terms of housing and employment opportunities. So this is where we are trying to promote, and I don't think, quite honestly, we have enough good models good evaluated models about those kinds of diversionary services that we see here. And I actually think that's a great promise for where we go forward here. So, so we've seen some things with some promise, right? So we have, I think the, uh, many of you have heard of Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, the LEAD program, which I think has some opportunities here. We haven't really seen the data on treatment and substance use, but I think you know, it looks at how, in essence, almost like a drug market intervention, but how do you get people out of the Could you like just take a couple sentences to describe the LEAP program? Sh this sure. So, so no secret, and this is the other thing that we were looking at, it's called the Data Driven Justice Initiative, right? So you look at you know, um, who's coming in contact with the criminal justice system. So who are law enforcement repeatedly running into in terms of, of criminal behavior? And no surprise if people with untreated addiction, untreated mental health issues. And right, so what it says to them is we can actually have a different response to them uh, instead of pursuing arrest and incarceration. And what it does is identify, so you know, we've seen Daniel Webster you know, 10 times in the past month, can we have, get Daniel to come in and basically you know, surround Daniel with a host of social service programs around him to meet his you know, housing needs, uh, mental health needs, substance use treatment needs. So, so I think it's showing great promise in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, it started actually out of a police chief in Gloucester. It was called the Police Assisted Addiction Recovery Initiative, right? Where the Gloucester police chief basically said, regardless of criminal charges, come into the police station and we will find you treatment and we'll actually case manage you through treatment. Um, and it's been replicated a, a number of different times. But, but I do think that we need, you know, one of the things, uh, one of my criticisms around drug court. Um, one is I think we're getting abysmal results because drug courts are only referring to certain kinds of treatment. Yes. Um, and we, we actually changed that at the federal level and basically said um, uh, they were not offering medication-assisted treatment, which is the standard of care for people with opioid use disorders, so we changed that. But, but basically, we had a, like a one-size-fits-all model. I, I don't know if any of you are familiar, it's called the sequential interceptor model. It's really interesting, came mostly out of the mental health world, 
where they looked at every intersection with the criminal justice system, and against that had all of these evidence-based models where you could divert people to. And, and I don't think we have as much on the, on the drug use side of the equation. So I really do think that part of the equation that's right for research and practice is what are the models that we have at each step along the way, beyond just drug court, mm -hmm. to really look at these kinds of interventions. The, the second is for people who are incarcerated. So, so how do we move people, particularly those folks who have just simple possession charges, largely possessing drugs because of their own addiction issues, and move them away from the criminal justice system in the first place? The second is, even for the people who are, who are in jail, they are not getting evidence-based treatment at all. We know that. And so part of it is how do we make sure those, those people are getting good evidence-based treatment? And so more and more we're seeing, uh, and again, I, you know, there's lots of problems at the federal level, but mostly at the state and county level. We're having real issues with sheriffs incorporating treatment as part. I, I think we're seeing that more and more. And then the third is how do we make sure that people who are re-entering our community um, are getting hooked up with good treatment, also getting good housing and employment opportunities. Data in Massachusetts, just really startling where, as we're looking at fatal overdoses, that those who are, just came out of jails and prisons were 124% more likely to have a fatal overdose event than those folks uh, that in the general population. So we're missing opportunities to do that. But, but I think the challenge becomes, you know, and, and I, I gotta say, I think we were somewhat, this was one area that we're, we actually had a lot of bipartisan support in Congress. Mm -hmm. And we also heard a lot of the presidential candidates kind of saying the same thing. Um, that changed pretty dramatically. Um, and and it's very interesting, there was, um, uh, President Trump had a forum in New Jersey on this issue, and he was looking at the arrest data, and he was basically saying where the drops in arrest data, and basically blaming the Obama administration that we caused the opioid epidemic, epidemic because by not, we arresting, by not arresting people, right? So they were using that data, despite the fact that, that quite honestly, we did not see increases in crime related largely, um, uh, large increases in crime as it relates to that uh, diminishing, you know. So uh, unfortunately, I think we're beginning to see a pivot back with the Attorney General now talking about mandatory minimums, talking about being tough on crime. And, and this administration kind of posturing for basically a tough on crime approach is what we do. So, you know, what's, what's really kind of depressing to me um, is that we hope that that trajectory would keep going mm -hmm. and that we could actually begin to really, um, you know, have not just the treatment and prevention lines go up, but have the kind of law enforcement lines go down here. Um, I, I, I will say one of the other things, and you and I had talked about this, very interesting looking at what's happening in Mexico right now. So you've been probably seeing reporting around that just huge increases in homicide. Well, um, I can say this now, I'm not a government person. <laughs> so our State Department, so, uh, with please. the support of the Mexican gov uh, government, took this strategy of focusing on high value targets, right? So high value drug cartel targets. So if we basically just pick off the heads of the Sinaloa and the Pacific cartel, um, that we will uh, basically diminish the drug trade. Um, and uh, that was clearly not the case. And all it did was fracture all of the cartels. So you had huge surges in violence and homicides associated with everyone jockeying for a position. So I would agree with you. I thought your 16, I thought, not your number, I thought the 16% number was really low, mm -hmm. particularly as we've seen heroin just her increase in many, many communities throughout the United States. So, you know, it's really, I think it's a, it's, it's a challenge. And, and part of the challenge is that each administration gets to come in and define their own priorities, mm -hmm. um, despite all that evidence that we have um, uh, you know against those kinds of approaches so you know it, it um, you know it was kind of a real challenge I think um, and I'll say you know we had some success in other um, areas where we did you know um, I uh, you know be hard-pressed to say that we got the State Department to change their focus and approach so, somewhat mm -hmm. right um, you know I, I think they you know added alternative development you know, kind of reluctantly to their portfolio mm -hmm. of services. But, you know, their bread and butter is, you know, how many hectares of, you know, cocaine did did we spray in Colombia? Um, if you don't mind, can I just ask you about, I'm trying to imagine being a fly on the wall of some of the meetings you've been in, hard to do. 
But when the law enforcement of folks are puffing up their chest about the kilos or whatever it is that they are you know, doing with respect to the supply side, do those conversations boil down to what about the violence? Like, it, it's... No, so it wasn't, it's interesting that you say, it wasn't the violence. So the question that I would ask, and there's not a lot of evidence to support this, is the, the whole rationale you think of behind, behind getting drugs out of a community, right, are, you know, we've known from a public health standpoint that price and availability are two risk factors, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen it with tobacco, we see it with alcohol, we see it with food. So there's a lot of, you know, kind of thinking that if you take the bad stuff out, um, and particularly if you lower the price, that you will reduce use. And I think there's a lot of you know, evidence there. So my question back to them was, so what? Right? So show me what's the, if, if your metric is just how many arrests you made, how many violent gangs you broke up, or how many, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, kind of smaller drug organizations did you break up, um, if that's your only metric, then you basically get to um, have a whole lot of success. And, and I gotta tell you, it resonates, it resonates with people in the community, it resonates with legislators, and it, you know, it, res it resonates in Congress. You know, so I'm sure you've The metrics that they're using resonate. Correct, right, so, you know, um, I don't know how many times I've seen, and you've probably seen them at all, where, you know, you see this Coast Guard boat you know, um, you know, taking huge bales of cocaine, and you know, to the average person, that looks really great. But like, did it make a difference? Right. You know, and the answers are really no. I, let me, you know, when I was kind of coming into ONDCP, we had this measure, um, this supply reduction measure, that if we can basically take forty percent of the drugs that are coming into the United States, that was our, that was the metric. Um, that that's success. And so the logical question is, why 40%, <laughs> right? And by every account it was invented, right? Because people postulated that 40% would reduce availability, thereby driving increases, and you would extract so much money out of the system that you would do irreparable harm to the drug cartels. And like I would say, by what evidentiary standards are you creating that, right? Meanwhile, we have really good public health data about what's effective prevention and treatment services. But but it's a bohemian. You know, it's um, and you know, when you have, you know, large organizations like the Department of Justice and the State Department, you know, kind of who built in essence their life and their career on one set of, you know, standards. And and, and I will say it's not as if those folks didn't understand that there was a demand component to this. Um, but you know, but clearly that was not kind of where their money was headed. I want, I want to now give folks an opportunity to make comments or questions. Shawnee, hopefully the mic will reach most of you, or if you can come to the mic, uh, that would be great. Um, for if that is too intimidating, we will just repeat your question up here. Go ahead, then. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned earlier that you had a statutory role in terms of the budgets for these agencies. Did you look at you know how these agencies, not just the amount of funding, but how they're funded from instead of having block budgets, for example, activity-based funding that incentivizes these kinds of innovative uh, programs or public health approaches, the payment mechanisms to these agencies. If you do public health interventions, will incentivize you, will will help support that. So is that part of the agency you worked in, or not, not to that general degree? But what we would do, well, I, in some respects, we would, right? So we would basically ask them. You know, if you, if you look at um, some of the incentives that we're trying to put in place, um, many agencies would then kind of list out in their portfolio or their budget the kinds of things that they were going to do to meet those goals, right? So uh, let me give you an example. This is more on the health side of the equation, where you know, to the point of saying we were missing, you know, in, in addiction, we, you know, let people progress. Um, you know, so how do we get earlier upstream? 
in these issues by um, employing things like screening and brief intervention, right? So that you have these earlier in your health interventions. So that's probably an example where we say, okay, we want this from a policy perspective. Show us and demonstrate from a budget perspective how you're lining up your budget to meet those kinds of public health interventions. In terms of Thank you. The, the challenge is um, federal grants can only go so far, right? We have a huge healthcare system, of, you know, of which federal funding, I mean, Medicaid aside, um, is, uh, uh, yeah, so grant components can only do so much. Um, but, but often those interventions and those innovations were kind of proof of concept so that you could then try to kind of exert change within a larger healthcare system. Well, the audio is better if they do it up here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Jude Park. I have been um, uh, working with people who use drugs, particularly heroin and cocaine, for the past seven years in Baltimore and in other places as well. Um, and I wanted to ask, and this is kind of like a critique I have of a lot of public health approaches and criminal justice approaches to drug policy um, and the you know substance use issues, overdose, things like that. Um, to what extent are the perspectives of drug dealers taken into account when making these policies? I say that because a lot of the people who I've worked with are also drug dealers. They get arrested for possession, but they also are engaged in the drug trade in some way. And um, also, we all also know that um, people who are battling addiction, um, a lot of these people are in low income um, neighborhoods. They don't have that many, you know, uh, much choice in what they do to make a living as well. No, uh, not enough either. Uh, uh, and it's interesting because, you know, part of what, um, so, so let me use the kind of heroin fentanyl as a really good example of, of that. Um, I, I don't think we have, we've done enough kind of quantitative interviews, uh, qualitative interviews with active drug users in terms of their attitudes around fentanyl. Um, and I think from a public health standpoint, it really hampers our ability to think about uh, good interventions. Um, so, so I don't think we do it enough uh, interviews either with active drug users or those who are actively involved in, in the drug trade. To, to really be able to understand what the policy levels are, level uh, levers are, um, it's. Um, I think it's hard sometimes for federal government um, to do those kinds of things. But uh, you know that's where we count on uh, places like Johns Hopkins and a lot of other places to be able to do that because um, you know the, the question uh, then becomes kind of like so so why why are you federal government kind of paying? Um, for uh, interviews with people who are actively uh, using drugs or dealing drugs and not doing anything about it? Um, I, would, I would say that um, two effective violence reduction strategies probably are informed by the uh, views and experiences of people in the drug trade. Uh, cure violence, for example, the Safe Streets model um, it wasn't explicit about that, but I know when the program was being developed a little more than 20 years ago, the people who were putting that together were gang members who sold drugs. And when we haven't had success in every single neighborhood that's implemented safe streets, but when we've had, what's been really striking is the beneficial effects are almost immediate. And to me, the only way that I interpreted that, they didn't immediately change attitudes, did they? Like overnight, Safe Streets is here, we're going to stop shooting people. No, they came in and actually had listened in on some of these discussions. They came in and started mediating disputes between rival drug organizations. They needed that. That is the nature of an underground economy. There is no mechanism to resolve differences. You can't sue someone or take them to court. So they need some mechanism to resolve their disputes. And Safe Streets really is designed in part to do that. The drug market intervention with the focus deterrence, I think, also was informed by the experiences and thinking there. Um, I think it has had some success in some places, but the broader economic 
and social forces are, are such that they don't resolve the violence component to it. Um, so, but, but I, I appreciate the underlying support because if your, your mindset is just, you know, these high-level law enforcement people who, you know, like to um, advance their career by, you know, these big fancy prosecutions and the drug calls and stuff like that, that, that hasn't really gotten us anywhere. I, I also think that we left, so, so it's very interesting, and Daniel and I were talking about this before, that, you know, if you look at, um, you know, and I do think that, that some other countries, particularly Colombia now, right, in terms of the ceasefire, is really looking at amping up their alternative development strategy, right? Because you, you can't basically ask a coca farmer to give up his or her livelihood with no other economic alternatives in place. Same, same with poppy growers in Mexico. And, and I think the kind of economic piece of this um, has often been left out. So we're talking here about kind of law enforcement, public health, but there's got to be some level of economic development, right? And this is where I think public health moving into social determinant areas really becomes important because you've got to look at things like poverty and employment and housing opportunities. I think all of us understand that whether it's violence and drug use or other issues that there are those kinds of social factors that we have really not addressed. And, and I think that that's, you know, I think we have to think of it really as a three-legged stool um, in terms of, you know, yes, there's probably a right place for law enforcement, um, but public health plays a big role. And I think we've got to think about economic development as part of the package of services that we give to communities because, because otherwise we continue down this like siloed approach and we're really not getting to root cause issues. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Hi, uh, I'm Eugenio Weigen. I'm with the Center for American Progress. I have been looking at uh, drug violence and gun violence in particular. Um, I have a comment in terms of the Mexico issue that uh, one of the reasons that it also became very violent in Mexico, besides the, the breaking down of cartels, it, it was actually the access to guns uh, as well that allowed uh, a lot of cartels to confront each other, but also to divert to other types of crimes, not drug related, which are robberies and kidnappings. And I have a question. Uh, Regarding drug legalization, would you say that's something good? Should certain drugs be regulated, uh, legalized or not? Or what types of comments do you guys uh, have on that front? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I wish I knew what the answer is, right? Because I, like, clearly, you know, the prohibition you know, of drugs and the criminalization of drugs has its own set of significant risk and significant harm. I think what you have to balance it against is, you know, I, I think we all understand that legalization or illegal drugs has a certain disinhibitory factor to it, right? That if they're illegal, there's a certain group of people who won't do them because they're illegal. So, so, so I've got, I think we have to really look at the trade-off between um, legalization and what that means from a public health standpoint. Uh, I, I will say this though, and I've always said this before, is like, we know that these public health strategies work. We do. We just haven't really implemented them to scale. Mm -hmm. and, and so my piece is, before we go down the road of legalization, like why don't we, and I, I realize it's gotta be coupled with criminal justice reform because of disproportionality issues. But, but, but I also think that we haven't really fully implemented ever in the history of the country um, uh, where, um, where we can implement those kinds of public health strategies. Right, so even Portugal, their evaluation of legalization attributes some of the dramatic decreases they've had in drug use is the fact that they fully leaned into public health related approaches mm -hmm. in the sense they have a treatment on demand system for people who are able to do that. So, so, so my piece is, let's be careful here. I think we really have to um, study the risks and benefits, but, but first and foremost, like let's implement this stuff to scale. We only have 14% of people in the United States are getting treatment. Like, we have a ways to go here before we're doing it. And then, you know, I, I will say one of the things we didn't accomplish, look at prevention funding. You know, and it's been flat. I mean, th those of us in the public health world that know prevention always gets short shrift, 
in any of these kinds of discussions. So, um, you know, I think we've got, uh, you know, let's fully, let's fully implement kind of, you know, what we know to work uh, first and foremost. That's always been, and that's not even me as a government official. That's just me, someone who's been doing the work for a while. Um, I'll just briefly say that um, I think most productively we need to be thinking about a path forward in which people in the criminal justice system from, from law enforcement, prosecutors, and so on, um, the accountability metric is really violence and um, morbidity, mortality connected to drugs. It needs to be a harm-oriented um, orientation and not a reward for arresting people. Um, and right now, um, you know, if you put somebody, a prosecutor, prosecutors traditionally, not always, but traditionally, uh, you sort of earn your stripes by putting people behind bars for a very long time. It would be interesting to sort of somehow concoct something in which there's your your the way you are judged is sort of your return on investment. So if I'm incarcerating somebody for 40 years or something, as opposed to how how else could I use the state's resources to you know to, to bring down violence? So I think it's going to be a combination of what public health does, which is actually do rigorous studies to find out what what law enforcement, criminal justice, and supportive health and social service uh, supports produce the outcome. And then the other aspect of public health, which is advocacy for a more just system. Uh, so that it's producing um, you know, fewer people who are harmed by the system, who live with drug charges you know, for their lives. Um, you know, so that's generally, <laughs> I think, the, the path for them. And there was, you know, <clears throat> that was the other area where there was a significant amount of bipartisan supporters, really around broad-based criminal justice reform. And I will say then Senator Sessions was, I think, the only senator um, who was actually opposed. To that. <laughs> but, um, but, but absent federal leadership, what's the role of states and locals in this? And, and we've had some very conservative states who have, I think, entertained broad-based criminal justice reform and actually justice reinvestment, right, where they are reinvesting the savings from incarceration and, and investing in kind of public health and health intervention approaches. So, um, so, so again, I think the opportunities are continue to work at, um, you know, um, one, kind of educating the public on kind of that, that, you know, we can do these simultaneously and not increase crime, because I think that's, you know, the narrative that most people would look at that arrest data and, you know, uh, you could interpret that many different ways, right? Um, uh, and, you know, to your point, Daniel, how do we incentivize the criminal justice system um, and reward them on a different set of metrics other than arrest and incarceration? Because that's the current way that we measure success. Well, we had our biggest reductions in gun violence uh, when we were having our biggest reductions in drug arrests and shifting it more towards gun and violent offenders. Um, so I hope that, that lesson is lost. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to have to move on, So, because I think people are going to kick us out of here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was curious if there's, um, I've been sort of influenced by Glenn Treisman, and I wondered if there was sort of a instructive epidemic, or I guess I'm thinking about the Japanese amphetamine approach, which um, basically, it, you don't know, uh, or maybe I should, that's one that I'm, I'm searching for a kind of template model, and I wondered, is there an instructive model that you yourself look at, or is there something that you're pulling from your own playbook? Certainly Portugal is one such model, but I feel Japan is. Yeah, I'm not familiar. Um, I'm actually not familiar with it. OK, I'd be happy to send you a little email. But I just I wonder, when you go to your playbook of things that really work, um, are there are there instructive epidemics? I don't know who's gotten it right. You know, um, 
I, you know, I don't. Um, and, you know, I wish we did. I, uh, I, you know, part of this goes back to I think each country is different. Surely. And, that, and that's really, I think, hard to basically say. And we try to be very careful as the U.S. not to dictate what other countries' drug policies would, would be. Um, but, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. All right. It's made perhaps refreshing to end an uh, academic seminar with, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. There's, There's a lot of stuff we There's do more. know. There's a lot that we don't. Uh, thank you very much for coming in.